Well, welcome to St Mungo's Online. My name's the Reverend Ollie Clegg and I'm the Associate Rector here at St Mungo's. In a minute, we are going to be joining Mighty Mungo's, which is our primary focus, family focused time where we're able to think about what it means to follow Jesus. And we're going to be going over to the Lions family in a moment. That's going to last about 20 minutes. There's going to be a short break where you can refill your coffee cups, even go to the bathroom if you need a break. And then at 10.30, we're going to be starting our adult focus part of the service, where there's going to be a time of extended worship, prayer, a talk from the Bible, and an opportunity to respond. We hope that you're going to enjoy the service, whatever point you connect with us. And if you're a guest with us, we hope that you're going to be blessed. So why don't we sit back and enjoy episode two of Mighty Mungos and find out what the Lions family have been up to this week. Good morning, guys. It's so great to be with you again this morning for episode two of Mighty Mungos. Uh, we're looking forward to spending some time together again this morning, uh, and we're going to start, as we always do, with our warm-up. So it's time to get on your feet for the Mighty Minute. I don't know about you, but that's got me going. Uh, it's time now to see some of your amazing faces. You've been busy all week filming your favourite jokes, and we're going to play some of them now in our slot called Joke of the Week. Why did the toilet roll not cross the road? Because he would get stuck in the crack. <laughs> um, what do you call a three-hump camel? I don't know. What do you call a three-humped camel? Pregnant. <laughs> Addy. Yeah. Why did the fly fall off the wall? I don't know. Why did the fly fall off the wall? He had a piano tied to his leg. <laughs> what do you call a lady with two toilets on her head? I don't know. Lulu. <laughs> so, do you have a joke? If you do, film it landscape and then email it to david.lions at samungos.org and maybe in future weeks we'll see you on Joke of the Week. My favourite book in the whole Bible is Colossians uh, and my favourite verse in that is chapter 2 verse 7 which says this. So then, just as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him strengthened in the faith as you are taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Once we start to understand just how much God has done for us, not because of anything that we've done, not because we've earned it or deserved it, but because he loves us, because he loves you. He really loves you. Not only that, but he actually likes you. He thinks you're amazing. And when we start to think about that, and we start to get our head around that, then what happens is that something inside changes and it starts to bubble up inside and we can't help but overflow with thankfulness. So what are you thankful for? Send me your videos. Remember, landscape or sideways as we like to call it here. I want to hear what are you 
thankful to God for. Gratitude Attitude. I'm thankful for reading. I'm thankful for my family and friends. For learning how to make bread. My friends. Thank you, my dad. I'm thankful for my dog, Woody. That's what God made and all the things in the earth. I don't know about you, but what I find is when I start thanking God for the small things in my life, uh, I can't help but get on a roll and keep going, and then it starts to bubble over into worship and praise. And that is exactly what we're going to do now. It's time for WhatsApp! <laughs>
Wow, I don't know about you, but I just love that worship. Uh, it's time now for some teaching, so get comfy and grab a seat. It's that time in the morning when we get to look at God's Word together and we get to find out a bit more about who God is and how much He loves you. So last week we looked at Psalm 23, God is my shepherd, and we learned three things. I wonder if you can remember them. The first is that God thinks that you're valuable. The second is that God leads us, He leads you. The third is that God is with us, He's with you through the tough times. Now, in the Bible, there are loads and loads of different names for God. So last week we learned God is our shepherd. And one of the cool things about learning about the names of God is that it helps us to understand more about his character, about who he is, and about how much he loves us. So this morning, we're going to look at the name of God, which is in Hebrew, which is the language that the Old Testament was written in, Yahweh Shammah, which means God is there. That's one of the names of God, that God is there. Uh, and that is something which is a great promise for us to hold on to this morning. All through the Bible, we read story after story about how God is present with his people, that he's with his people. He's not a God who is kind of up, far away, distant, looking down on what's going on. No, he's a God who's right in the thick of it. He's in the midst of it. He is with his people uh, and he is a God who is there. In the Old Testament, there's a book called Ezekiel. And I'll be honest with you, it's a book that's really kind of tricky to kind of get your head around and to understand exactly what's going on. But in the middle of it, uh, Ezekiel talks about seeing a city that's going to be built in the future. And that city, he says, is going to be known as a place where Yahweh Shammah, which God is there, is going to be known as a city where God is there. And if I'm honest with you, I don't exactly know what Ezekiel means by the city that's going to be built in the future. You see, some people think that it's talking about when Jesus comes. Some people think that it's talking about in the future when the world ends and when the earth is restored and becomes the new city, the new creation. The thing that I take from it is this great assurance that no matter what tomorrow brings, no matter what the future brings, that God is there. God is in it. He is with us. He's a God who is present uh, in the now and he's present in the future as well. We don't know, do we, what the future is going to look like. We're here, we're just starting to come out of lockdown. Things have eased a little bit. We can maybe uh, meet our friends in the back garden, but we can't really play together. If we've got grandparents nearby, uh, we can maybe have a picnic with them in the park, but we can't really do the thing that we love to do with grandparents and that grandparents are the very best in the whole world at doing. And that's, of course, giving cuddles. We can't do that yet. And that's really hard. It's really uncertain. It's really difficult to know exactly what the next few months and, uh, are going to look like and how they're going to feel. But this passage tells us and it gives us this great promise that no matter what happens, no matter what it looks like, that God is there. God was at the beginning and he's at the end and he's in this middle bit with us as well. Uh, we can't escape God's presence. There's an amazing psalm, Psalm 139. It says, where can I go from your presence, God? Uh, if I go up to the highest place, uh, you're there. If I go right down to the depths, you're there also. The dark is as light to you. It's an amazing uh, picture of just what God is like. We can't outrun him. We can't hide from him. He's there. He's with us when things are really great and when things are really tough, when we're doing really well and when we're really struggling. And his presence is there because he's a God who is interested in you. He loves you. He wants to be with you because he thinks that you're totally amazing. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that you're a God who is there. Thank you that you're a God that was there in the beginning, you're there in the end, and you're there in the present. Father, thank you that you know each one of us so well that you know exactly what we need, when we need, and how we need it. How we need your presence. 
Father, I pray that this week that we will experience your presence in our life. I pray that we will know the nearness of you this week. Would you come, Holy Spirit, and fill each one of us right now? We thank you, Father, for your goodness and your faithfulness to each one of us. Bless each one of us now. Amen. Here at Mighty Mungo's, we really miss you. We really miss seeing your faces and hanging out together. Um, so it's just brilliant that you're sending in your video clips uh, so that we can put them together. And then on a Sunday morning, we get to celebrate and join together. And it feels like we're together as God's family all again. Uh, so this week, let's see who sent in their memory verse challenge. Roll the tape. seeing your faces it's so good uh, it's now time of course to set you this week's memory verse which is God is our refuge and strength a help always near in times of great trouble God is our refuge and strength a help always near in times of great trouble so get filming and send those videos in to david.lions at stmongos.org. I can't wait to see who's gonna send me their videos this week. It's that time in the morning when we've got to say goodbye. Our time's come to an end, uh, but we'll be back next week with more exciting stuff on Mighty Mongos. But before we go, there's just time for my favorite section, which is of course, Family Face Off. <laughs> that you've enjoyed Mighty Mongo's 
as much as we've enjoyed putting it together for you. Uh, before we go, I'm just going to ask my good friend Daniel if he can pray for us uh, before we go. So over to you, Daniel. Thank you for all the children at St Mungo's. And thank you that they're all special. And thank you that you're a good father. And, we, and, we, and you're a great God to us all. Amen. It's now time for you to pop off to the loo, uh, grab a drink, uh, get a refill of snacks. Uh, if you need to get any art resources or worship resources together, go and do that now. We've got a short break, but join us back here at 10.30 uh, for the next part of the service. See you next week for more Mighty Mungos.
Well, welcome to St Mungo's Church online service this Sunday. My name is the Reverend Ollie Clegg and I'm the Associate Rector here at St Mungo's. We've just had another incredible episode, episode two of Mighty Mungo's. So if you missed it, I'd really encourage you to go back and watch it. If you are a guest with us this morning, we hope you're going to encounter God through the word, through the worship, through the prayer. And uh, there is an opportunity, if you're watching us on the church online platform, then please do uh, request prayer. We are eager to pray for you this morning. All you have to do is press the live prayer and uh, people will uh, pray for you through chat. Now, if you're watching through YouTube, you can still do it. If you're watching it on your TV, you can pick up your mobile and go on to the Samongo's uh, website and click on the online platform and then request prayer through your mobile. So you're not going to lose out this morning. Anyway, we're going to start by continuing our worship from the week by singing our first hymn. So let's worship the Lord together. We're going to continue our worship from our weeks by saying our liturgy together. And the latter part of our liturgy is taken from Revelation 15, where we declare how great and wondrous are God's deeds here on the world. Uh, the words that you say have the word all before them. So let's come to God and let's worship using our liturgy today. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Give us the joy of your saving help and sustain us with your life-giving spirit. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word and to seek forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith 
So let's say this prayer together. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance with joy. And in our song, we will praise God. Let's say this from Revelation 15. Great and wonderful are your deeds, Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O ruler of the nations. Who shall not revere and praise your name, O Lord? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship in your presence. For your just dealings have been revealed. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honour and glory and might for ever and ever. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.
Great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run The fountain I drink from, oh he is my soul Let the 
Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide The ransom for my life, oh he is my soul For you are good, good Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song for you. Well, thanks again to the worship team for leading us into the presence of God. And I'd really encourage you uh, throughout your weeks to be listening to worship music. Worship music just 
helps us to come into the presence of God. It helps us to remind us of who God is. Uh, and that's really important. Just as we take one day at a time uh, in, in, in this uh, COVID-19 process that we find ourselves in, that we would continue to center our lives on Jesus. Now, uh, this has been our second week of Mighty Mungos, and we hope as, as a church family that you'll be really enjoying that. And we want to uh, allow, uh, let you know of another exciting opportunity that is coming up next Sunday. That is the 21st of June. And that is that after the service at 12 o'clock, we are going to be offering live uh, prayer ministry on Zoom. And so th- th- in the run up to, to next Sunday, if you're a member of St. Mungo's, you will receive an uh, email through Church Week giving you a code for Zoom uh, and inviting you to come uh, onto the Zoom call and to receive some prayer ministry. And I know a lot of you have been missing this. So this is just a great opportunity for you to receive prayer, live prayer through Zoom. And there'll be more information about that through the week. Um, there will also be another chance to experience that on the 19th of July. So this won't be the first time we'll do it. So that's the 21st of June next Sunday and the 19th of July we'll be offering prayer ministry through Zoom. Now, before we meet uh, n- uh, n- next Sunday, there will be another uh, review by the Scottish Government on the 18th of June. And what we, what we will say is if there are any changes, we will be communicating to you by by email. So please do check your emails. I know some of the church suite emails do go into uh, your junk file, so please do be checking that. And let's continue to honor the Scottish government uh, directions as we move forward uh, in this COVID-19 pandemic. Now, it's good to be able just to agree with what we believe. And so this morning, we're going to be saying the creed together that we normally say in our communion. And the words are going to appear on the screen. So let's say this together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I've been missing saying the Lord's Prayer together. The Lord's Prayer is really a community prayer. It's, it's not so much an individual prayer, although we can pray it individually. I know I do. But it is a community prayer. So let's say the Lord's Prayer together before we come to Malcolm's sermon. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now let's go over to Malcolm as he brings a word from the word this morning.
Just want to welcome everybody again and just thank you so much for joining us today. Let me just pray before we look at God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you you have provided by your spirit your amazing word. Will you speak to us through scripture this morning? Amen. My simple message today is found in Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 where it says very simply stand united singular in vision contending for people's trust in the message the good news another verse says stand firm in the spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel this morning i want to share with st mungo's church a vision for unity but at the same time, I want to make it clear that perhaps as a church, we're facing the greatest challenge to our unity that we've faced in 30 years. And that is the physical separation, the inability to gather together as a physical church that COVID-19 crisis has forced upon us. We need to think about how to maintain unity despite a pandemic. Of course, at the same time, one of the biggest ironies of the coronavirus pandemic is our own church vision. And it's expressed in a singular statement, single statement that sounds somehow incredibly inappropriate. Our vision is to be an infectious center of spiritual health. Yep, that's it. Our vision is to be an infectious center of spiritual health. Does anybody want to have an infection center at the moment? But I'm going to stick with our vision and I want to take back that word infectious from COVID-19 and reappropriate it for the church. And it's our unity that will help us fulfill the vision of being an infectious center of spiritual health. It says in verse 27, stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news. Okay, let's put my text in context. So I'm reading back and starting at Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Meanwhile, live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. Let nothing in your conduct hang on whether I come or not. Your conduct must be the same whether I show up to see things for myself or hear of it from a distance. Stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news, not flinching or dodging in the slightest before the opposition. Your courage and unity will show them what they are up against, defeat for them, victory for you, and both because of God. This shows you that Unity is our most precious commodity in this church. And this passage says that unity of vision will make us a healthy church, a resilient church, a powerful church. Now, if you're watching and you're a member of another local congregation, please apply this to your congregation. Unity is so important to us that it is part of what defines us as St. Mungo's Church. In our vision and value articles, we unpack that vision. And it's often summarized and called the Mungo vision, M-U-N-G-O-S. The M of being a missional church, the U of united church, then a nurturing church, a growing church, an offering church and a serving church. And we actually spell out and define what that unity looks like. It says a united church being united together in praise and prayer and purpose. That's why we've got to keep gathering together, yes, online and in Zoom calls for our prayer and our praise. But that word purpose is another word for vision. The Amplified Translation is you're standing firm in united spirit and purpose. And this morning I want to spend time opening up this foundational part of the church's life. So we understand again what being a united church means, particularly in a time of very rapid change and physical separation and struggles and crisis. What does unity look like in the time of a pandemic? Now let's see how Paul takes us and challenges us about unity. And he suggests that unity is an expression of living appropriate Christian lives worthy of the gospel. The NIV says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you 
or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. So he's concerned about their future struggles, but Paul wants to prepare the church. But he believes the most important instruction at this moment is to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens, literally, that is just one word, only. It's a very strong word. He's saying the force of this is tremendous. He's saying this one thing and one thing only must you do. It's been described as Paul raising a warning finger, just like I do. He knows there are big problems outside the church, but first he wants to tackle big problems inside the church, or it'll distract them from the great objective of being a gospel people, of being a missional people. And he says, therefore, you've got to live ma a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul's first major challenge to the Philippian church is therefore, and therefore to our church, is each one of us is to live in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. Now, the whole of the rest of the book of Philippians will tell us about how we live a life that's worthy. In the original language, the conduct yourself in a manner is actually a single word that's about living as a good citizen for us, citizens of heaven. Well, one translation says, whatever happens as citizens of heaven, live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And it starts with our conduct. Live let your conduct be worthy. Again, Professor Tom Wright says that this is, this is about public behaviour. It's about there being no difference between the public sphere and the private sphere for a Christian. See, how we live a gospel lifestyle is absolutely crucial because the gospel, the good news, the message of Christ is proclaimed as much by our lives as well as our lips. It's both our words and our works. It's always both. A few years ago, there was a, a really good book on evangelism and sharing the gospel that was entitled Becoming a Contagious Christian. And this was followed up by Building a Contagious Church. And it's all about how we view and do evangelism. Now, would any, would any publisher now publish a book with the word contagious in its title right at the moment? But actually, there is this irony that we are called to be contagious. And we're called both to share our faith because we've got to be contagious Christians. And one way that affects it is the manner of our life. Our attitudes, our habits, our behavior in the workplace, in the home, in the community, online and offline. Because if we do not live a life, uh, a manner worthy of the gospel, we're saying the gospel doesn't matter. It's irrelevant and it's powerless to really bring change. Now, interestingly, Paul then picks up a particular aspect of a worthy life and what it looks like. And do you know what it is? It's unity. He says unity in the church together. He relates directly this living worthy with living in true unity. Back to our whole text, verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. This is one of the clearest calls for unity in a local congregation, in a local church. And it's anywhere in scripture, it's, it's very clear that fundamental unity is so important in a local church. Now, why did Paul have to speak of unity? Well, because unity in the local church is very hard to create and maintain. It, it doesn't happen naturally, and it doesn't keep going naturally. So never assume that everything was fine in the early church. It wasn't. And it appears that the Philippians were facing some major public leadership splits, creating disunity. See, he even goes as far as naming names. Imagine you get named in a, in, in a, in a letter that becomes Holy Scripture. Philippians 4 verse 2, I plead with Eudia and I plead with Syntyche to be, the, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Have that same mind, that unity of thinking. No wonder Paul is concerned about unity. So let's get back to our core bit of our text. I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. 
Well, the message says, stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news. Now, actually, that verse, that's why, that's why I'm looking at using different versions to help you. Paul uses some very concentrated and interlocking concepts of unity. He seems to be choosing his words very particularly here. Each word comes with a different facet. And we've got to look at what, how it applies to us now, particularly during our physical separation. This is how I want to apply it, particularly at the moment. The principles always apply, but what does it look like now to us over, say, the next six months or longer? How do we stay one church? How do we not spread out and scatter and disperse and lose that unity? So number one, it's unity of belief. Number one, unity of belief. He says, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. The foundation of unity is what we, when we strive together with one accord for the faith of the gospel. This is unity of faith. And here the word faith is understood as the body of belief by which the gospel is defined. And the call to strive for faith is the equivalent of striving for truth. So there needs to be a uni unity of belief, a unity of understanding, uh, an agreement in the fundamental foundations of the faith and the gospel and the work of Christ on the cross and the resurrection and how we receive salvation. That faith is the body of divine truth that was given to the church. Jude 3 talks about the faith which has once and for all been delivered to the saints. Now, so we have to know what constitutes the gospel, the truth that we share, which Paul has been already talking about and he will continue to explain the gospel through the whole of Philippians. The unity of the church is a unity of belief of salvation. So there needs to be an understanding, an agreed understanding of gospel. There can be no genuine unity without an agreement over the core of the gospel. And we find that, of course, fundamentally and finally expressed in the scriptures. So there is an irreducible minimum to which what is true orthodox, if that's the right word, faith, that Paul is talking about here. So you always start with scripture, because scripture contains all we need for life and faith. Scripture is the authoritative word of God, which we come under, we submit to, we submit our minds to. We are united in the belief of the authority of Scripture as God's inspired, revealed word. So you see, the Bible never says, oh, well, um, just being nice people is a good enough foundation for unity. No, it doesn't. There has to be that body of faith in the gospel that we strive together for. The gospel faith has then been expressed and codified and agreed in, in orthodox and historical doctrine of the worldwide church over the centuries and millennia, especially over the person and the work of Christ. It's non-negotiable. And these are what have been condensed into what are called the historic creeds, like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, often said weakly in some churches. And, and this is the foundation of what we believe in unity. Those in turn have been expanded and expounded in some of the great confessions of faith. For instance, the Scottish Presbyterian Church has the Westminster Confession at its heart. The Anglican Church had the 39 articles at their heart. Then again, other groups we're associated with, such as the Evangelical Alliance, have formulated statements of faith summarising our beliefs through which we can have a unity of mission and ministry. And these are these are all ways to express the foundational truth of Scripture, which is the bedrock of unity, the faith of the full gospel. But having said that, mere assent of a formula of words alone doesn't go far enough. Alec Matias says, Yet unity without mutual love, common interest and agreed values could be as cold as a marriage of convenience. And that's why, uh, as far as Paul is concerned, Biblical unity more, needs more than just unity of belief. It needs a unity of heart and soul, an inner unity, a relational unity. So number two, unity of heart and soul. The NIV says, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Young's translation says that you stand fast in one spirit with one soul, striving together for the faith of the good news. 
Again, Paul uses words in this verse that is very precise. And what is translated there as one is literally the word psyche. Some translations do put it as soul. So it's referring to the sphere of affection and moral energy, a unity of feeling, a unity of values that express something of the complex of heart and soul and will and experience, one of emotional, uh, emotional decisions. This is a very deep unity. This is something of true relationship. This is something of, of real created community. It comes can only come through time and sacrifice and love and trust. It takes time to build that kind of unity. I often say of people, you know, uh, uh, that, oh, cut them and they'll bleed some mungos. It's in their blood. And that's the kind of unity that we need and we need to keep it during a pandemic. But you know, that still isn't enough. Implicit in the words he chose is unity of purpose or unity of vision. So number three, unity of vision and purpose. Stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news. Or uh, the Amplified says that you are standing firm in united spirit and purpose, striving side by side, contending with a single mind for the faith of the glad tidings of the gospel. Being of one mind, of one person, one vision is really important. Now, in one sense, you could say that the general vision and purpose is the same for every local church, uh, every single church, because it's been expressed in Scripture. Sometimes we call them the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. The Great Commandment, Matthew 22, 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind and love your neighbour as yourself. And the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. But how that, how that is expressed in a local church, how that is relationally expressed, how that will be specifically worked out, uh, will, will actually be different. Because every church has a different, perhaps, calling or expression or um, geography or social mix. And God will use that to make every church have a unique calling or vision. And that's why we as a church have a specific vision statement. It's always good to be able to say, what is it? And ours is, our vision is to be an infectious center of spiritual health. Yep, even in a pandemic, our vision is still to be an infectious center of spiritual health. And, and that's why we, we, we put all this in writing, so that, so that when someone, for instance, joins St. Mungo's Church, perhaps they're moving, from a, uh, they're moving to the area and they're finding a new church, we expect them to be able to align themselves with our vision and values in one mind and one purpose, so that we're willing to function together under the same, I don't know what you call it, philosophy of ministry, DNA, heartbeat, because that's an aspect of unity vision and purpose. Now that vision and purpose has to always be flexible and adaptable because how we express it will constantly be changing. And, and we're in the midst of that right now. How on earth do we be what God has called St. Mungo's to be in an entirely new world, an entirely new communication style, an entirely new relational style that's going on short term and maybe long term? How do we be infectious center of spiritual health in an infectious world? What does unity look like when we can't physically be together? And you think that will be enough, unity of vision and purpose, but Paul still hasn't finished yet. Because in his mind, you see, you can write out a vision statement and people can passively accept it, but acquiescence is not unity. Consent is not cooperation. Approval is not partnership. It must become a choice of the will expressed in action. And again, Paul is using very specific words here. So number four, unity of action. Stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news. And AC, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. The New Living says, you will know that you are standing side by side, fighting together for the good news. 
These are very physical images he's using here. The first is a call to contend, to stand firm, together. It's a call to be tenacious. And he's probably, yes, picturing a military image, uh, either of the Greek, but more likely the Roman army. When they went into battle, they went, think of the picture of the Roman army with the legionnaires marching forward or standing firm together. They would stand there, they'd link their shields, they'd have their swords, that impenetrable wall, that unity that they saw there. And then Paul adds a slightly different picture. They're striving together, literally means side by side. And actually that's coming from athletics. This is more of a team word, actually. This is about being a team together. And it's probably taken from the um, uh, ancient Greek um, athletics, particularly wrestling. They'd actually wrestle not as individuals, but as teams. And would say, here is a team getting ready to strive together side by side. Perhaps the most modern example would be rugby. In a rugby scrum, People are linked together, shoulder to shoulder, standing firm. They won't be pushed back because everyone is dependent on the people around them. And in fact, you can even become attacking, you can push forward, even become a rolling mall. And that's because everybody is linked together. And that's the image that Paul is calling for unity in the church, very physical. Real church, and by the way, real church is the same, whether it's physical church or online church, both are real, but real church mustn't become uh, a matter of convenience, uh, a bit of a consumer um, that you sample in and out of. That's one of the, I think, the great dangers of the moment. The great danger at the moment of, of, being on, of being real church but online is that we can become just online passive consumers because you don't feel that need to strive together. So you can start to slip into a bubble. You can start to get that individualism that isn't found in scripture. And, and my worry is that the longer this goes on for, and it will be, that we'll start to split a path, we'll just move apart as relational bonds loosen, habits change, we go, well, we just don't need that. And the concept of true commitment to a local church will fall away. I think we've got to be more like, I don't know, sports people, think whether it's a footballer or the rugby people, people in teams, you actually, during this time, if you're, if you're a professional sportsman, a team player, you've got to keep yourself fit and ready so that you can get back and be part of a team when it happens. Now you think, come on, Paul, isn't that enough about unity? And he goes, no, no, there's one more crucial factor that unites us. Uh, and a, a power that enables us, an experience that unites us. And so number five, unity of the spirit. NIV, I know that you'll stand firm in the one spirit. The passion says, I know that you'll stand united in the one spirit and one passion. Now I talked about this verse a couple of weeks ago on Pentecost Sunday. This is a great Holy Spirit text. And I'm so glad that uh, the, in the recent edition of the NIV translation has got the accuracy to make it a Holy Spirit, a capital S spirit word. Most recent translations and all the commentaries and scholars agree that this is most likely to be talking about the Holy Spirit because it's the way that Paul uses exactly the same words in Corinthians and elsewhere and Ephesians. And that's why he's not so much talking about the human spirit. It might be there, but it's much more likely to be the Holy Spirit. And all the other things I've said about unity need to be embraced and empowered and experienced through the person and the work of the Spirit. As he said, he's telling us that actually probably the human spirit isn't enough. Good intentions aren't enough. This level of unity he, he expects to happen is, is actually supernatural. It needs God needs to enable it, it has to be actualized by a Holy Spirit experience. Because in the end, because of the way we are built as human beings, always wanting to go away, such unity in a local church has to be a miracle. It has to come by miracle and it has to be held together. And that is done by our shared experience of the Spirit. So I think it's important that you, during this time, get filled again and again in the Spirit. Because as we're filled individually, we'll be one in the Spirit. So whenever you get a chance, pray for yourself. Or maybe during uh, 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 our online church service and we have prayer, get prayed for for a fresh filling of the Spirit. Maybe 
um, uh, if, you're, if you're on your own or if other people get prayed for, when you meet in a Zoom house group, get prayed for. It's so important that, we, that all the other aspects of unity get embraced and, and soaked by the Spirit of God because I believe it is a supernatural unity. And I believe St. Mungo's has had this for, for a long time. That's what often people comment on. It's a real unity. And I believe it comes from the work of the Spirit. And then we have to maintain it. Ephesians 4.3 is a direct command to each of us make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. And at such a time as this, can you make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in St. Mungo's Church? And let me briefly look at the last section, because when we move on to chapter two, and actually the subject carries on, it's still the unity is in mind, and we'll be getting other images of unity and, and the impact of unity, what Christ-like unity looks like. But there is one immediate uh, result I just want to draw your attention to, one practical impact that unity will have upon individuals and the church that's feeling under pressure, that's struggling. And it seems to suggest that unity together will allow us to make sure it'll deal with our fears and give us assurance. Without being united together, we'll, we'll be, we'll be um, scattered, um, but, we, but unity will hold us together and we'll have assurance of our eternal salvation. It says, stand firm, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news, not flinching or dodging in the slightest before the opposition. Your courage and unity will show them what they're up against. Defeat for them, victory for you, and both because of God. Unity will stop us being frightened. It will help us overcome fear. That's what it says the NIV version. Striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Don't be frightened. And in fact, that word frightened literally means don't be intimidated. Then you will never be shaken or intimidated by the opposition that rises up against you. Now, clearly, for the Philippians, the opposition was going to be physical uh, persecution. Um, and, and, but I do believe the principle can be taken and applied to other things that will threaten to frighten us, overwhelm us, stress us, make us struggle. And I believe there are other things that, that come in fear. We can be intimidated by the fear of the virus, F intimidated by the worries for us as individuals, uh, economic, relational, health, all the problems, fear of what it will mean for the church. And this says you do not have to. If we stay united, we will not be. Actually, Paul uses a double negative. You will definitely not in no way be overwhelmed by fear. And you know that word frightened there? And that, that word um, uh, shaken or intimidated it is a very unique word. And it's the word that has the picture word for the uncontrolled stampede of startled horses. It's the word for the uncontrolled stampede of startled horses. It says we will not be stampeded. We will not be scattered if we maintain the unity. More than that, as we, as we overcome these things that threaten us, we will have a deeper assurance of our salvation. The message says, your courage and unity will show them that what they're up against, defeat for them, victory for you, and both because of God. The NIV says, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed and that you will be saved and that by God. Do you know, when everything is shaking, when everything is being undermined, we go, what is important? And the important thing is our eternal salvation. That will, and we'll have a deeper sense of our eternal salvation. We will not be frightened. We will not lose assurance because of our unity. So let me conclude. Last week, I asked certain medical doctors I know what the difference is between contagious and infectious. And apparently there is a technical difference about the way a virus is transmitted through touch or, or aerosol. But often in medical purposes, they seem to be interchangeable. I went to the higher authority. I went to Mr. Google. And Mr. Google says, though, as a general rule, every contagious disease is infectious. Not every infectious disease are contagious. But again, basically, they're used interchangeably. So to conclude, I want us to be 
contagious Christians in an infectious church that experiences true unity. So St Mungo's, stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news. Let's pray. Lord, I pray now, as we're scattered physically, I pray you'll unite us spiritually. Thank you. Christians around the world are united in you. We thank you for that worldwide unity. And some people watching are from different places in the world. And thank you that we're united together in you. But Lord, I particularly pray for unity in St Mungo's Church during this time and this season. You'll help us all maintain the unity of the Spirit because you're a wonderful Lord who loves us. Amen. encountered God through the word and the spirit this morning. We, we need both of these in our, in our lives to, to be fed and to live as Malcolm challenges us to be uh, as contagious Christians. I just want to read that verse what, from Philippians verse 27 from chapter 1 in the message version. Stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news. And that, that's really the challenge for us as Christians, that we stand united, we stand together as God's family, especially in this time where uh, so much is going on. We stand together, we stand as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And with a singular vision, we know what our vision is, St. Mungo's. And if you're joining in from another church, you know, hopefully you know what your vision is. Contending for people's trust in the message, the good news. So this week, let's stand united with a singular vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news. And let's pr finish with the blessing. And now may the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Have a great week, St. Mungo's.